talking. Hi guys, this is Jacqueline, and I'm just going to be talking to you guys about the first um, ever female Florentine painter, Sister Platilinelli. So first, let's talk a little bit about her early life and the status of the nun as rebel. Um, so at the age of 14, Platilinelli joined the Dominican convent of Santa Caterina di Siena in 1538. The convent was actually located in the heart of Florence in the Piazza della Signore, Signoria, which I have a picture of on the right. Uh, Nelly received an independence as a nun that was not afforded to her as the daughter of a merchant family. Uh, it was a life that offered exposure to a variety of fine imported goods, and she was able to kind of converse and be around these famous male painters of her time, which only fueled her creative endeavors once she entered the convent. While showing great skills in both drawing and copying at a young age, it was Nellie's acute spiritual connection that allowed her to propel as an honored member of the convent. Uh, she served as prioress, so the head of the convent, three times, thus empowering her as an artist. Um, she, she was able to train pupils and create uh, art outside of societal control and also the um, constraints of, you know, being like a lowly nun. So she had status and power in her role in the convent. And so her status, both spiritually and socially as a nun, allowed her work to transcend the material world. So she was kind of outside of the social pressures and also her spiritual acuteness really allowed her to tap into something that was greater than the material, uh, greater than, you know, worldly, worldly desires or possessions. So especially when considering the weighty social pressures that dictated the lives of Florence uh, women, nuns had this special role as outsiders and challengers to the patriarchy to an extent um, they were able to kind of hang out in their convents and they socialized in these isolated, sometimes cloistered lifestyles. And they had an increased access to education and patronage that was not given to other women or other women artists outside of the convents. Uh, as Mary Gerard argues, who we know, we've read a few stuff by her. So um, she talks about, and the quote is right there, that in Florence, no kind of difference had so deep an imprint on the human psyche as gender and no category of women raised so audible as op an oppositional voice as did the nuns. But nuns served an important role in challenging the, ha the hyper-masculinized public spaces present in Florence art and culture. Uh, and they could calm the equally emerging counter fear of the feminine. So in the picture that I have here, um, these are kind of the copies in the current state of the plaza and just this hypersexuality of the... Um, both the political scene and of the artistic scene. So in this increased uh, hypermasculinity, there was also an increased fear of women and a need to silence and suppress. So while the freedom and education offered to women through monastic life was intended to right the wrongs of what was seen as the inferior deviant sex, monasticism still served as an outlet for women to escape the social pressures that ruled daily life. Um, women artists historically did not have the legal rights to issue invoices in their name, um, making it unfeasible for them to, you know, to thrive commercially in the art scene. And they also had male family members that were um, robbing women of their painterly identity for works that they completed. So they were even not being able to sign their names to works or, you know, earn money for their works. And But in Nellie's convent, however, um, they were able to thrive off of devotional commissions and actually maintain economic self-sufficiency through their works. So these commissions were crucial to Nelly's artistic life, especially when we consider the trend in Florence of patronage by women for women, which Jane, which uh, Jane Fortune, the founder of uh, Advancing Women Artists, which we'll be talking about later, raises this kind of this feminine patronage as beginning with Nelly in the Renaissance. Um, so we have examples of patronage that can validate Nelly's work and support women artists centuries before they're even allowed to study art in, in academies or before it's even socially acceptable that they, you know, can, can work and exist in the art market. So this makes Nelly's self-taught and undaunted paintings and sketches, which we'll look at later, um, even more impressive. And her status as a teacher, um, within her convent, you know, having a woman run workshop, um, is extremely influential. Sir Platilla or Sister Platilla, um, due to the work of the American nonprofit, which I mentioned just just a few seconds earlier, the advocating woman artist was rediscovered as not only the first female painter in Florence, um, significantly famous in her time, but uh, virtually unremembered. But she was also the first woman to paint the Last Supper, which at 21 feet long and seven feet high is one of the largest paintings in the world by an early female artist. So this is a scene that was never tackled by women and also a size that was completely um, contrary to um, what was expected of women at this time. So Nellie's Last Supper, uh, um, we'll just be reading kind of the main the main point or, or argument of this presentation just at the bottom. Uh, Nellie's Last Supper, when considering the role of nun artist, religious imagery in Renaissance Florence, and the recent restoration project, 
stands as a testament to her prowess as an artist and the capacity of female artistic collaboration, seen in the art and scholarship of Renaissance and modern women. Um, so we'll be just kind of looking at both the relevance of the restoration and kind of how this painting would have been received and made for the time in the Renaissance. Um, so yeah, just kind of, we're going to be looking closer at the work. The Last Supper is one of the most important New Testament images and then is a prestigious subject matter as we kind of know from just seeing it over and over in um, Italian painting. And it's actually used to highlight the mastery of male anatomy and perspective, usually done by male artists at the height of their careers. So immediately I think of, like, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's and Milan's in the refectory, his Last Supper. So um, for women artists, their work is usually relegated to smaller devotional images or portraitures and still lifes. Uh, so Nelly's immense depiction of 13 um, life-sized men, um, not only men but apostles, puts her in the leagues of her famous male counterparts, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci and Andrea del Sorto that I've mentioned. Um, she would even have seen some of these Last Supper images in Florence. So if we're looking kind of more specifically at the table scene, we have a lot of detail here, which is not customary for most scenes of the Last Supper. So there is a special emphasis on the food in this meal, arranged in an inviting and diverse spread of dishes across the horizontal table. We also have the glassware and food that represent a strong example of still life rendering. So as a woman, Nellie would need to show the, her acute skill in still life. So she's no doubt highlighting that prowess that she possesses. Looking more specifically at some of the dishware and some of the food on the table, um, notable inclusions include the lamb in front of Christ. So Christ in the center, we're gonna look close on the close up of the dishes and just to his heraldic left side. Um, details in is this elaborate dishware, which may be in part to some of the Florentine noblewomen that brought it um, to the convent, or um, it's also noted by Fortune that maybe this is comes from her exposure as the daughter of a merchant family. You know, her father bringing kind of these these fineries from different foreign locations, countries in the east, bringing it. So she's taking those influences and using that to um, detail her dishware and her glassware. We also have a lot of scattered loaves of bread on the table. And the wine and wine that we actually see poured into all the glasses, so it's very much a dinner scene. This would be recognizable as a, you know a casual, a casual meal that the apostles are actually you know eating and participating and discussing during. Um, the lamb in front of Christ, we automatically get some associations with the sacrificial lamb um, and foreshadowing the crucifixion. And there's also inclusions of staple Tuscan dishes. We see kind of these beans, fava beans, which would be native to Tuscany and would be um, you know a staple in Tuscan meals and we have the uh, there's also little kind of lettuce a symbol of abstinence so uh, definitely notable since she is a nun um, like I mentioned earlier the table is of a peasant style meal with a neat pleated cream tablecloth so Nellie is definitely highlighting the pleated tableware and the detail that she adds to her food and to her dishes because uh, this was expected of women artists at the time. They were best for rendering these details like precious objects and lace work. Uh, so Nellie is proving masterful in this aspect and she also though is tackling those lofty biblical subjects in her work which is not not natural, not normal. So, um, so just jumping a little bit in on why she would spend such an emphasis on the food that's on the table and such a variety and vastness of dishes. Um, so while women may not have a physical seat in the artistic depictions of the Last Supper, the hagiography, so the saints' lives, points to the transcendent and nourishing powder, power of the body of Christ and the devotion of important holy women. In addition, the Eucharist shows a depiction of Christ that is separate from the male body and the masculine sexuality. Um, so one of my scholars that I noted in my paper actually talks about this Eucharist motif as um, a, being very important to female religious figures, highlighting the key role food plays in the miracles of the saints. Um, so there's a lot of fasting narratives and narratives of, there's an example of St. Catherine surviving on just the Eucharist alone for nourishment. And these instances pop out a lot in the lives of the female saints, a lot more than male saints. So um, while some Last Supper depictions focus less on food and on the meal itself, Nellie's inclusion and masterful rendering of food provides projection of female sanctity within the male-dominated meal. Um, taking it one step further, a woman's lived experience within the Florentine patriarchal structure um, would allow them to understand the Last Supper in the broadest and deepest emotional sense. So we're looking at this meal as a depiction of holy triumph over the human body's futility and social injustice. So kind of the body as this place of 
battleground, you know, Jesus to having the ultimate sacrifice of sacrificing himself, sacrificing his body, giving his body up to the disciples. And it's kind of an active participant that all of the nuns have to undergo every day, you know, feeling that their female body is kind of under scrutiny or under attack. Due to the intimate relationship that women and religious have with both the body of Christ and their own subjugated feminine body, a last supper executed by this nun artist, like Platilinelli, can hold the capacity to validate these experiences in a way that the male artist cannot. Yeah, so after kind of talking about the exceptional detailed precision that she gives to her uh, food and the feminist analysis of the Eucharist, we can see how Nellie's still life lends itself to a feminized reimagining of the male-dominated scene, but there's also a more obvious marker of uh, female influence within this work. So this is a picture of Nellie's signature, which um, some sources say that it's on the back of the painting, but I actually see it very much so in the this this corner. But nevertheless, uh, Nellie's signature can be seen uh, in its signing work was unheard of for women artists, no, nobility or nuns, and especially for devotional images, so a woman would not be signing her work um, primarily. The signature attributes the work to Nellie, but it does not offer any extra uh, explanation or justification of womanly skill, which we've seen uh, with Anglu Solo in, in our, one of our lectures. She signs her works with kind of an explanation of her expertise and her womanly skill. Um, Pray for the Painteress actually offers a universal acknowledgement of the work of women um, artists as a collective, and it elevates the role of the painter as someone worthy of prayer and devotion. This counters the norm of female painter signatures, if done at all, and also breaks the notion of a singular genius of painting. The Last Supper was not in fact done by one individual painteress, but by many. And just as it takes a collaboration of pupils to complete this work, the capacity for women's greatness in painting cannot be allocated to just one person. And this signature shows that there can be a multiplicity of contributors, like pay for the painteress, the, just the idea of the female painter. Uh, so a lot of what we just talked about would not even have come to the come to the foreground if not for the restoration project that happened back in October of 2019. Um, this painting was in pretty bad shape from just neglect, moving from two storage facilities when the convent was shut down during Napoleonic rule um, and moved to different storage rooms in different convents before being restored by the um, foundation advocating women artists. So. Through the restoration, Nellie's unabashed use of paint and the analysis of thick brush strokes, she used very vibrant, thick color and paint. She painted with a lot of paint on her paintbrush and her paramount design of the flesh and expression. So she also had really detailed diseño or drawings um, underneath the paint. Um, and this supports a female painter's ability to recreate biblical scenes predominantly painted by men and of holy men in a stunning technique. So um, the goal of AWA, which was founded, I'll just go back to that slide, founded in 2009, um, you know, the goal of AWA, which was founded in 2009, uh, they actually cite Platilinelli as their imp inspiration and catalyst for their nonprofit. Um, they're trying to bring justice to the artists that have been forgotten or intentionally suppressed, um, the Renaissance women artists. <clears throat> Founder and author Jane Fortune names the core issue that AWA's action aims to remedy um, for re Renaissance artists, saying that uh, a lot of the notable works of women artists languish in storage and they also are in dire need of repair and, maintain and maintenance. So art advocating women artists has been set up to kind of bring these women artists out of storage, fix up their paintings, and then put them on wall. Uh, so after the restoration project, we can see where it is in its rightful place in the Santa Maria Novella Museum Refectory in Florence. Uh, so it's after it finished the restoration project. This is kind of the, just talk briefly, that she was one of the four painters mentioned in Vasari's Lives of Lives of the Artist. So uh, she was kind of breached over in Vasari's account because she had a massive impact, but had such a small and superficial entry by Vasari. So she, he says that she did so many paintings that it would take too long to discuss them all in the houses of the Florentine nobility. So uh, we show that we see that uh, the scholarship is intentionally leaving out these women artists, reserving spaces for the male genius. You know, he, Vasari writes, you know, 17 pages about Michelangelo's greatness, but you know, only a few sentences about Platilinelli uh, in her uh, very successful workshop that she ran.